And so we begin our worship by singing the hymn, Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of Creation. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you, and also with you. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to be our advocate in heaven, and to bring us to eternal life. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolve to keep God's commandments, and to live in love and peace with all. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour, in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent. Have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins. Confirm and strengthen us in all goodness and keep us in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And so we join in with the Gloria.
So we say together the collect for this third Sunday before Advent. Almighty Father, whose will is to restore all things in your beloved Son, the King of all, govern the hearts and minds of those in authority and bring the families of the nations, divided and torn apart by the ravages of sin, to be subject to his just and gentle rule, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And so our first reading from Thessalonians. As to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we beg you, brothers and sisters, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as though from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord is already here. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the lawless one is revealed, the one destined for destruction. He opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, declare himself to be God. Do you not remember that I told you these things when I was still with you? But we must always give thanks to God for you, brothers and sisters, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and through belief in the truth. For this purpose, he called you through our proclamation of the good news so that you may be obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers and sisters, Stand firm and hold fast to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by word of mouth or by letter. Now, may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and through grace gave us eternal comfort and good hope, comfort your hearts and strengthen them in every good work and word. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So we sing again, Jesus is Lord.
Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. Some Sadducees, those who say there is no resurrection, came to Jesus and asked him a question. Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies, leaving a wife but no children, the man shall marry the widow and raise up children for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first married and died childless, then the second and the third married her. And so in the same way, all seven died childless. Finally, the woman also died. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will the woman be? For the seven had married her. Jesus said to them, those who belong to this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are considered worthy of a place in that age and in the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. Indeed, they cannot die any more, because they are like angels and the children of God, being children of the resurrection. And the fact that the dead are raised, Moses himself showed in the story about the bush, where he speaks of the Lord as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Now he is God, not of the dead, but of the living, but to him all of them are alive. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. In the name of God, Father, Son and Holy Ghost. Amen. And so we come to those four pictures, which in a moment will become comprehensible if they're not already. Over recent years, the Church of England has identified the period from All Saints Day to Advent Sunday, basically the month of November, as the kingdom season with the liturgical colour red. Somebody asked me at St Matthew's this morning why the hangings were all red. I had to explain. I said, you should come and join us at this Zoom service and you'll find out. Anyway, including this period, this season includes All Saints, All Souls, Remembrance Sunday and the Feast of Christ the King. There are our four illustrations, All Saints, All Souls, Remembrance Sunday and the Feast of Christ the King. As well, of course, the season is in the depths of autumn. It's a time particularly given over to remembrance, reflection and recollection. All things that certainly have value, but which can lead to melancholy. And that can all too easily slip from being delicious of a review of good things in our pasts to becoming corrosive. Those good things have all been lost and there is no hope for the future. I know this tendency in myself. And I know that two and a bit years of plague restrictions, coupled with even a cursory review of the state of the world today, do nothing to lift the spirits. But that's not, of course, the intention behind the kingdom season. Rather, it's an encouragement to us to use reflection on the past as a springboard into the future, building on the good foundations laid before and avoiding making again the mistakes of the past that have led before to misery and human diminishment. The first reading today from Paul's second letter to, Thess <clears throat> second letter to the Thessalonians is his attempt to reassure a young church that whilst life in the world will bring all sorts of tribulations, they are not to see every such upheaval as a coming of the end times. When those times do come, they will know full well, because the signs will be incontrovertible. But in any case, the people making up the church in Thessalonica need not be anxious, because God has chosen them as the first fruits for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and through belief in the truth. What's required of them is that they stand firm and hold fast to the faith that they have been taught. 
whilst we cannot claim to be a young church, we nevertheless are like those Thessalonian Christians being chosen by God through belief in truth. And though our world may seem to be a sea of tumult and troubles, we with them will obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ, if only we stand fast and hold firm. Today's Gospel reading from St Luke opens with some Sadducees posing a question to Jesus. The Sadducees represented the upper echelons of Jewish society. They were conservative in outlook and were strongly, though not exclusively, associated with the priestly caste. They had particular responsibility for the maintenance of the Jerusalem temple. Our readings of the New Testament often put them in clear opposition to the Pharisees, and there were differences in belief between them, notably that the Pharisees favoured the oral tradition of the Torah, the law, and they believed in resurrection, whereas the Sadducees demanded a more literal interpretation of the written Torah, and they did not believe in resurrection. That said, both Sadducees and Pharisees were members of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish council, and both loved to develop their faith through discussion, sometimes, as in this case, on abstruse topics. This method of advancing an argument by drawing conclusions from an extreme hypothetical example is somewhat alien to us, but it wasn't exceptional at the time. In this particular case, however, it's difficult to imagine that they hope to gain anything from the discussion other than to score a point over Jesus. The Sadducees did not believe in resurrection. So why were they asking who would be given, who would be the wife of the much married woman? Sorry, the much married man in the resurrection. Why? In any case, were they inquiring into a law which was given in Deuteronomy 25, 5 to 6? that had long fallen into disuse by the time this question was put. It's all a bit of a fake inquiry, in fact. They hoped to trap Jesus into supporting the idea of resurrection and thereby proving, in their eyes at least, that his view was misguided. And they were doing it by recourse to an absurd, absurd argument. But Jesus cuts through this obscurantism by stating that a law which was intended to provide a way of ensuring a legal succession had no place in a heavenly existence, which by its nature has no place for death itself. But Jesus goes on to press his point much further than his questioners intended or perhaps even conceived. He challenges the Sadducees to recognise that even their beloved written Torah implies a belief in eternal life. Quoting as he does from Exodus 3 verse 6, the passage about the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. It doesn't sound very co um, convincing to us as a proof of external life. But to those accustomed to the rabbinic method, relying on the precise wording of the scriptural text. This is a conclusive argument. Only living beings have a God, inanimate objects and the dead can only have a creator. So by saying that the God of Abraham who was dead, the God of Isaac who had died, the God of Jacob who had died, implies that they must be living again. Otherwise they would have said the creator of Abraham, the creator of Isaac and the creator of Jacob. If this morning's gospel reading had gone on one verse more, we would have learnt that the Sadducees were very impressed by Jesus' argument. And if we'd read a further verse on after that, we would have been told that after that, they dared not ask him any more questions. That's all very well, perhaps, as far as it goes. But I'm indebted to this man, the late Professor Caird of Oxford, for expressing Jesus' argument 
in a way that's perhaps more congenial to the modern mind. He says this, all life here and hereafter consists in friendship with God and nothing less is worthy of the name of life. Abraham was the friend of God and it is incredible that such friendship should be severed by death. Death may put an end to physical existence, but not to a relationship that is by nature eternal. People may lose their friends by death, but not God. People may lose their friends by death, but not God. I find this a very helpful thought to hold in this kingdom season. When we remember those who have died, our own dear ones, those people of faith who have inspired and encouraged us, and those whose lives have been cut short by war, or indeed when we are forced to consider the turbulence of our own times, economically, in relation to disease, climate change, natural disaster and war, and all the many other ills that beset us. Remember those lines. People may lose their friends by death, but not God. The name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. And so we affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made. Of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And now we listen to the lovely anthem, Touch the Earth Lightly.
And so let us pray. Lord, as your Christian disciples, we come to you with thanks for the sacrifice that you made for us on the cross. So that along with Job, we are gratefully able to rejoice and say, I know that my Redeemer lives. Thank you, risen Lord, for giving us the gift of salvation, which comes through our faith in you, our living God. We are alive with you, and because of your great love for us, we will live forever with you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. <coughs> Lord, we pray for our leaders, both at home and throughout the world. We ask that when they are under pressure and making difficult decisions, they are able to call upon you for your wisdom. Human greed and desire for economic gain can bring about repercussions and long-standing consequences. We ask, therefore, that by your grace, all decision makers may come together in a way that can bring hope and light to our planet and world. As the United Nations Climate Conference begins in Egypt, we pray especially today that our nations can act together and be good stewards of your creation, Lord. We pray that they can work towards repairing the damage that has been caused and look to bringing about a world on earth that can be filled with peace, justice and righteousness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for our families, our friends, our neighbours and the communities of our two churches, St Edmunds and St Matthews. Help us to set aside some time each day to be quietly in your presence, Lord. A time for thanksgiving and worship to hear you speak to us and fill us with the strength and courage we need to continue along our paths of faithfulness and service to you. Give us, we pray, the grace to serve you by sharing the wonders and joys of our faith in you. Help us, Lord, to live a life worthy of you, bearing fruit in every good deed. Help us to share your love with others and to exclude no one. Help us to be joyful, to be patient and to be kind in everything that we undertake. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we think of those we know who are feeling sad or anxious, of those who are under pressure in these difficult times, whether at work or in their home lives, and of those who have little time or energy left for themselves or for quiet contemplation with you at the end of a long, hard day. We pray for the elderly, for the lonely whose days can sometimes feel too long and often seem meaningless for the sick, for the poor, and for the homeless as days draw in and winter starts to make its presence felt. The world is a complicated and difficult place for so many of us, your children. We pray that when life becomes hard for us, we can either help minister to the sick, the lonely and needy, or indeed we pray that we can individually remain in fellowship with you, our support and guide. And so, Lord, we pray for all of us who are suffering in body, mind and spirit. Help us to be ever aware of your light and to know that it can never be overpowered by darkness. As we remember that you are always there, dear Lord, to hold us in your loving arms and shine in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord. We thank you that in death we will live and that our lives after death will be deeper and different from the way they have been on earth. There'll be no more sin and no more pain, no more hatred and no more health problems. We trust you, dear Lord, that today's relationships of marriage and love will give way to new and more perfect relationships to come. We give our thanks for the departed. And we remember that death is not the end, but the beginning. We hope that all people who are and have been dear to us and have passed away have been lovingly greeted by you 
and are at peace with you in your heavenly kingdom. Bring your strength and precious love too, we pray, to those of us, your disciples on earth, who mourn their loss and miss their company in this earthly life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray together as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. So we sing our final hymn, a hymn of going out into the world. Forth in the peace of Christ we go. And now, may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. And so we come to our concluding voluntary. My thanks to uh, Matthew for being our engineer on this broadcast today. And thanks to all of you for joining in with us. And so let's hear the two-part invention.
Yeah, we are. <clears throat>